with you, I'd like you to open them with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We're going to spend a little bit of time in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and chapter 3 and, and Acts chapter 16. Uh, you can see the title of this sermon, uh, The Virtues of a Godly Woman. But guys, just let me let you in on a little secret. Just, just ladies, just do this for just a second. This applies to us too. It's really about a godly living, about a godly faith. So, okay, ladies, this sermon is for you this morning. So, uh, it is a joy to, to be able to come this Mother's Day. And, and I want us to look at a woman named Eunice. And some of you who've looked through the Bible, you, you know that name, and you can think exactly who she is. And others of you say, I'm so glad that my mom didn't name me Eunice. Uh, but however you land on that this morning, would you, would you just look with me at God's Word? Beginning, I'm going to begin at, at verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank my God whom I serve as I did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love, and of self-control. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for just the opportunity to look at a faithful mother this morning. Virtues that she possessed that we need in our own lives. So God, don't just give us an ear to hear this morning, but God, give us a heart to put into practice what we hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're familiar with Paul's pastoral letters, these letters that he writes to Timothy and Titus, in particular as he's writing this letter to Timothy, Timothy's going through a very difficult period of his life. Timothy was pastoring the church in Ephesus. And if you read just the very next verse, he, he's saying that we shouldn't be ashamed of Timothy. And then he said, remember how I'm urging you to stay in this place. There's something going on in the church in Ephesus, something going on in Timothy's life where he was fearful, he was timid, he was thinking about leaving the church, he was ready to go. And so this letter is just really a shot in the arm of encouragement. This is just, look at how well I've finished the race, Timothy, and I'm calling you. You need to finish this race well, this race of faith, and you need to serve the Lord and serve Him well here. But what's interesting in this letter is that Paul's writing this encouraging note to Timothy, a young pastor who's struggling, who's fearful, and not once, but twice, Paul reminds this young man, Timothy, of his mother and his mother's faith. I, I think we've heard that, that verse 7, for God gave us not a spirit of fear, but, a, but a, of power and love and of self-control. And, and perhaps you've memorized that and you've put that into your own heart and your own mind. But can I just tell you, isn't it amazing to see that in the context of remembering that we don't have a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power and of love, it it's, comes in the context of being reminded of the faith that his mother and grandmother possess? I, I said just a moment ago, ladies, you make an indelible mark on the lives of your children and grandchildren. 
your faith lived out before them puts an impression upon your children that cannot be moved or shaken. And just from from this text and what we see a little bit later in chapter 3, I want to just talk about two aspects of virtue of this woman. Now, we could spend a lot of time in Proverbs chapter 31 and talk about virtues of a godly woman, and there are so many there, but I just want to highlight two this morning that I think if, ladies and gentlemen, if we put these into practice in our lives, families will be changed for eternity. Notice the first virtue that, that is talked about with this woman, Eunice. She possessed a sincere faith. Did you see that in verse 5? A faith, a sincere faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. You know, if you were to translate literally that word sincere in English, the Greek word sounds a lot like hypocrisy, but it has this attachment at the front of it. It means without hypocrisy. In other words, Eunice had a faith that was so genuine and authentic that it didn't matter what was going on in life. Timothy saw a genuine, sincere, unhypocritical faith being lived out in her mother. In other words, they didn't get in the car and drive to church and yelling and screaming and fighting and then put on the happy face so they could walk into church. Well, that's, and that's not because they didn't have a car. Eunice, she lived out her faith sincerely. The world has enough cheap faith. The world has enough of Christians who would profess one thing and live another way. We must be, ladies and men, we must be men and women who possess a sincere, unhypocritical faith. For, for Eunice, it was what you see is what you get. And, and a computer term, we call that WYSIWYG. Have you ever heard that expression before? See, WYSIWYG, and, and I'm going to get too technical for some people, and for some people I'm going to be like not anywhere near technical enough. So those of you who really know a lot about this, you can just give me grace. And those of you who know nothing about this, just hang on for just a minute. So WYSIWYG is, is a computer interface that really was made popular in 1984. This small little company called Apple produced a computer called the Macintosh. And what the most amazing thing about this new personal computer is that it wasn't just this green screen with uh, green characters that you typed into. It had a user interface that when you printed something, what you printed in there looked exactly like it. And the reason that's significant is if WYSIWYG wasn't around, everything that we were typing and looking at might look something like this. That's HTML, hypertext markup language, and some of you know exactly what that is, and you can probably sit there and try to decode it and figure it all out. If you know those sort of things, then you could produce something that looks like this. But wouldn't it be so much easier just to open up the word processor and just type it in, put it in the gray background, red letters, and what you see is what you get? It is so much easier. Let me just come back. Your children, your grandchildren, they don't need to decode what you believe and how you act. They don't need to hear certain things coming out of your mouth and see other behaviors coming out out in your life. It, It needs to be so simple and so plain that what you see is what you get. Do you understand? A sincere faith. Now, if you would, turn for just a moment to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Look at verse 14. By the way, chapter 3, Paul's just saying, Timothy, things in the church aren't going to get much better. It's going to go from bad to worse. 
People are going to be believing whatever they want to believe, and, and, and it just doesn't paint a really good picture for Timothy, but says, still hold on. And then verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. I want you to hang on to that, that phrase, you have firmly believed. He, he's reminding Timothy, you know, your grandmother and your mother Eunice, that sincere faith that they possessed. It's not just a faith that you've understood and that you know, but it's something you firmly believe. That, that could be translated as something you become convinced of. A sincere faith is a convincing faith. It's sobering to hear statistics of how many youth walk out of church and high school and college and don't return. It's a generation that was the, the greatest generation, the, the builders, some 67% of that generation are professing believers. The millennial generation, about 15% are professing believers. Something in the baby boomers and the Gen X of which I'm a part, we've got to embrace and we've got to understand that there must be a convincing, sincere faith that's passed on to our children. There has to be something that's lived out in the home more than just, let's go to church on Sunday morning. It's the thing that we do and just press upon our children that we just show up on Sundays. A convincing faith is a faith that's lived out before them. Let me put it to you this way. One sermon lived is better than a hundred preached. Your children, mom and dad, need to see you living your faith. They need to, to see it so that they themselves will be convinced of the faith which you claim to hold on to. It's a sincere faith that Lois had. But it's also a sanctifying faith. Now, hang with me for just a minute on this. Look at, again at chapter 3. Listen again to verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, there was something about Lois, and there's something about Eunice, this woman who had been reared in a godly home that she knew. She was determined from childhood that she would teach her children the deep truths of the Scriptures. She would pass on to them the faith that she possessed. It was a sanctifying faith in this. Not that Timothy was saved because his mom was a Christian, but he was set apart from the very beginning and said, I'm going to live my life and my faith out in such a way in my family that my children can't help but to see Jesus in me. If we, if we turned over to, to Acts chapter 16, you don't necessarily have to turn there, but I'm just going to read Paul on a second missionary journey just parts ways with Barnabas and John Mark. And it says in verse 16, or chapter 16, verse 1, Paul came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. There's something about this sanctifying faith that Eunice was committed to no matter what. 
Isn't it curious that the only mention, the only time Timothy's father is mentioned in Scripture, it says that he's a Greek. Read there a Gentile. Read there an unbeliever. Eunice didn't once let that deter her from passing on a sincere faith to her child. I don't know what your home life looks like. I, I don't know if, if the, the man in your home is the spiritual leader that God's called him to be. I, I don't know if perhaps you come alone and you alone are professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you that's enough? Sanctifying faith can be seen in a godly woman who's living out her faith in a very sincere and convincing way. But notice how this sanctifying faith worked itself out. One, in a passion for the Word. Did you see that? In chapter 3, verse 15, and how from childhood you learn from the Scriptures. From the, from, from the very beginning, there was Eunice, and there was Lois, a faithful grandmother, and, the, and they're just showing and passing on to Timothy all that God's Word says so that the Word of God would dwell richly in his life as it was abiding in theirs. Eunice had to possess a passion for God's Word because she, she longed to see that living Word of God that can create faith be born in her own son. I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that when this is all over, I'm going to have some roast this afternoon. And my wife can make great roast. My, my grandmother, she would, she would come over and eat with us from time to time, and she would say, Shanta, did you use kitchen bouquet? She thought the gravy and the, it was so good, and Shanta's like, I don't know what that is. We've discovered it and we use it sometimes, but I'm telling you, this roast, when, when you eat roast at my house, it's just like it will fall, all, fall apart. And you just put it in your mouth and it's moist and succulent. It's just, you get just the right amount of potatoes and carrots in there and they're soft. Is anybody hungry yet? <laughs> the sound men are about to mute my microphone so they can go eat. Hey, can I tell you something? You can't create an appetite for something that you don't find appetizing. Let me say that again. You cannot create an appetite for something you don't find appetizing. Moms, dads, if you don't have a passion for the Word of God, if you're not consumed by God's revelation of Himself to you, you won't ever be able to pass that same kind of passion along to your parent, to your children. Because if you don't find it appetizing, you won't be able to create an appetite for it in your own children's lives. I don't know what it was like, but I know that Eunice had a passion for the Word of God. Because she, from the very moment he was a young boy, just trying to teach him faith. A sanctifying faith not only has a passion for the Word of God, but there, there's a purpose to parenting. Can I, can I remind you that Eunice was a Jewish woman, meaning that her, grand, her mother, Timothy's grandmother, was probably came to faith as a, as a Greek woman. Her, her name, Lois, is a Greek name, but she somehow came to Judaistic faith. So Lois and, and, and Eunice, they're, they're following the teachings of the Old Testament. But I, I don't know when it was. Maybe it was when Paul came through Lystra and Iconium on that first missionary journey and he began pro proclaiming the gospel. And he began to talk about Jesus was the long-promised Messiah. I, I don't know if it was then or if it was subsequently to that when believers just began to share their testimony. Something happened and Eunice and Lois 
were saved and they placed their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And although they had been following the tradition of Judaism and probably had gone to synagogue for worship, they now proclaimed a faith in Jesus as the promised Messiah and the tradition didn't matter near as much as a personal faith. Can I say when you're parenting with purpose that the traditions don't matter near as much as the content of the message of personal faith in a Savior whose name is Jesus? That we're not so caught up in all the trappings and traditions of church as much as we are passing along a passionate following of Jesus in our children. Amen or oh me? I, I want you to hear something else. When, when you're parenting with purpose, godliness, not happiness, is the aim of parenting. Say it again. Godliness, not happiness, is the aim of parenting. What do I mean by that? How many times have you heard it said, or perhaps even said it in your own conversations, all I want is for my children to be happy. Good intentions, kind heart, probably sincerely do want them to be happy. But parenting with purpose goes far beyond their happiness, and you know that their joy can only be found ultimately and ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So you would long for them to have a passionate pursuit of Jesus and walk with Him in godliness, even if that makes them miserable for a season in their life. Because ultimately, you know that their joy and their peace and their happiness is found not in anything this world offers, but in the Son of God who came and was slain and died a sinner's death in their place. You see, a sanctifying faith has a passion for the Word of God, and a sanctifying faith has a purpose for, for parenting. There are virtues a godly woman needs to possess. Just a couple that were witnessed in Eunice's life was that of a sincere faith and a sanctifying faith. By the way, her name could be translated a few different ways, but joyful victory, good victory. It's a combination of two Greek words, you meaning good, and Nike or Nike meaning victory. Can, can you imagine the joy Eunice had? And knowing that her son was spoken well of, not only in Lystra, but in Iconium and Derby. We're talking about a, a region. This woman's son was well spoken of. He possessed a faith that was genuine. And this man of God used mightily said, your son, I, I want him to accompany me and join me in doing this work that God's called me to do. Could you imagine the victory and the, the, the pride and just the, the glory that filled Eunice's soul and that joyful victory she had in realizing she had raised through God's strength and God's help a godly young man? I, I want families to experience that joyful victory. I, I want parents and families to be transformed by a sanctifying faith and a sincere faith. So what does that look like for you, mom, dad? It may look like I need to pick up my Bible. My children need to see me reading it. I need to be talking about the truths that it's teaching in my home. It may look like this, sitting around the table and having a family meeting 
and just expressing sincerely, guys, I haven't really been living the sincere faith that God's called me to, but I want you to know something. This day has made a difference, and I'm going to live out the faith that I know I possess before you. It may look like you, even in this moment, just praying and saying, God, not just part of me, all of me, it's yours. I belong to you. You will make an indelible mark on the lives of your boys and girls, your grandkids. And I pray that the mark that's left is a godly mark. That when they see your lives, they see Jesus bleeding through. And when they see your lives, they think of your faith. Imagine this, the only time Eunice, every time Eunice is mentioned in Scripture, she's mentioned as a believing woman. Oh, to leave a godly legacy that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren would say of you that my mother was a godly woman. My grandmother was a godly woman. She has shown and paved the way for me what godliness looks like. A sincere and a sanctifying faith are virtues you and I need to embrace.